Nearly everyone I meet thinks there is something wrong with the political system. They can complain about almost every aspect of it. Politicians don't listen. Politics is owned by the rich. The voting system needs to change. Schools are underfunded and don't teach useful skills. We need to reform everything. And yet they still say that the system itself needs preserving. No matter what's wrong with democracy, we need it. And at some point, one of these people will describe politicians or billionaires or the system itself as corrupt. Corrupt implies it was a good system, but it's changed in unacceptable ways. I'm going to let you in on a secret. It was never a good system. It's not corrupt. It's not broken. It's working exactly the way it was intended. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. The state is, and has always been, since its beginnings at the end of the Neolithic era, a way for powerful people to live off the labor of the poorer classes. In addition to that, it's always been a monopoly on land, laws, and violence. It's an involuntary institution that creates haves and have-nots by stealing from the many and giving to the few. That is the nature of the state. There are no other kinds of states. The only reason I could think someone would say the system is broken is that they've been taught all their lives to believe the state's purpose is to work for them, in other words, for us. The state's supposed to protect us and take care of our needs, isn't it? That's what I've been told. But in the past Ten years or so, I realized there's no reason to believe that anymore. I read the history of the state. The nature of the state, the rich living off the masses, has not changed. What has changed is the words our rulers have used to justify holding power over us. For a while, it was the divine right of kings. It seems quaint now to think it was only a few hundred years ago that belief was the basis of entire societies. What were our ancestors thinking? But then they couldn't download the same books as I can, and even I didn't start questioning the state until I had read a lot of books. Nowadays, the justification for the state has changed. No presidential candidate would actually say they had a mandate from God. Though some voters are so messianic, they pretty much worship their rulers like gods. But those people are way too certain of everything to ever watch a video like this. No, today, candidates for office promise to do, well, whatever the polls say the people want them to do. What that means in practice is they'll say things the people want them to say and do things the people who give them money want them to do. And we call that democracy. But only someone unconsciously using someone else's words would call that democracy. It's the same elite rule we've been living under for thousands of years now. But apparently, now the main criterion of ruling us is the person looks like someone you want to have a beer with. All states set up a kind of class structure. Early states just created two classes, the people who would work and the rulers who lived off the product of that work. Class has become more sophisticated since then, for sure, but the fundamental nature of the state hasn't changed. States still produce haves and have-nots. The haves necessarily have not just money, but influence. You can even look at the history of poverty itself and realize people become poor when others use the violence of the state 
to deprive them of what they have in order to get rich. The history of poverty is the history of the state. Once you understand that the state considers you its servant and not the other way around, you can begin to understand why things are the way they are. Most of the arguments I've heard in favor of the continued existence of the state and its power over us beg the question. <clears throat> there are plenty of examples of states doing things. The question is, are we better off this way? Like I say, I've studied some of this history, and I've also studied some anthropology, and I failed to find any time or place where the people seemed better off under someone else's rule than they had when they were free. I've seen countless examples of people trying to escape someone else's rule, but not one where people just submitted voluntarily. That's because there's nothing voluntary about the state. It never asked for your consent. It just asked you to shut up and obey, or else. There's a huge amount of violence just under the surface of any state society. The state imposes its social system with its political and economic institutions for the benefit of the people at the top of the state and their associates in business or wherever. The state rents out land so machines can tear everything of value out of it and employs the full force of its apparatus of violence against people who fight back. The state makes a million laws, and if it's in the interest of some members of the ruling class, some laws will be pursued vigorously. Look at drug prohibition. Some people would lose millions if drugs were legalized, some in the stock market, some in organized crime. And that's one reason why the police spend so much time enforcing that particular set of laws. If a landlord will benefit from raising rents and kicking people out of their homes, the police will be there to force them to leave, because that's the law. They're just following in the footsteps of their forefathers who kicked native people out of their land only a few generations ago. Right now, there's someone being forced to go through a huge stack of paper because they miscalculated somewhere and might go bankrupt paying the state what it decided that person should pay. If any of these people refuse, the police will forcibly restrain them. And if they resist, the police might put them in a cage, beat or taser them and then deny them medical attention, gas them, or even shoot them. It has that authority. If some homeless people want to sleep inside a building with no one else in it, the police will come to do, well, whatever they want, really. Cops like to bully people, and of course poor and homeless people are easy targets, along with mentally ill people, and of course people of color, since in a white supremacist state, people don't listen to or believe people who aren't white and well-to-do. Either way, the purpose of the police is to carry out the policies of the ruling class. To serve and protect, sure. Just not you or me. Now, it's easy to make the argument police fight and thereby deter crime. Again, this argument begs the question. <clears throat> we don't know if there would be as much crime if there had never been police. Police are the ones who saw to it the policies of the ruling class were implemented. They did that for hundreds of years, through the destruction of the commons and mutual aid, conscription, segregation, catching runaway slaves, suppressing strikes. Oppression and poverty are caused by violence and they lead to more violence. The unequal relationships, the pressure, the stress, the poverty, the restrictions, the suspicion, the intimidation, and the very real violence that all police are responsible for are all causes of more violence. 
but the violence might come out indirectly, as victims of state violence take it out on others. If the police had never existed, we could not have these problems. Now, I would be begging the question if I said the world would inevitably be better, but at least it would mean uh, free people making decisions for themselves with local systems of rule and justice that people actually agreed on together. Maybe uh, reconciliation instead of prison. Or perhaps I should have said... Um, it would mean not destroying those voluntary systems in the first place. True, we might not have as many highways, but then we might not need them. One advantage we have in fighting the state is it reveals its weakness in how it prioritizes what activities to suppress. Rape, domestic violence, these are quite common in patriarchal societies like North America, but police spend hardly any time trying to catch rapists and abusers and often simply don't take the victim seriously. Meanwhile, thousands of people get gassed, beaten, and arrested for attending protests against wars, oil pipelines, G8 summits. For an institution that assures us every day it cares about democracy, it's pretty afraid of letting angry voices be heard. We saw in Hong Kong this past week, the state wasn't doing what the people wanted, because it never does. So the people took to the streets in huge numbers to force the state to do one thing they wanted. That's a victory for real democracy. And it showed the world, among other things, that democracy comes only by working against the state. People in Hong Kong knew if you want change, you don't just wait around for an election and hope. You take it to the streets. And you keep it in the streets until your demands are met. The only problem I could find with how they did things is they left the state intact, so they'll need to fight it again. Of course, most people aren't anarchists, so most of those protesters wouldn't have realized how important it is to eliminate the state. And besides, it's not easy to tear down the state. But it's possible, and it's a long-term solution to the lack of democracy. So when people say the system is broken because of all the violence, they're saying the violence just under the surface should never have bubbled up and revealed itself. We don't like to be reminded the state has our heads in a vice. So we don't acknowledge the very real consequences of the state's actions before it's too late. The system would be more corrupt or broken if it had never been intended to carry out violence in service of the ruling class. I'm sure some people believe the people who founded their country were selfless heroes who gave us everything and asked nothing in return. They weren't. No states have ever been like that. The system is not broken. It's working exactly as designed. It's just that now you realize it was never designed to work for you. Thanks everyone for listening. Please hit like on this video if you learned anything at all, and hit subscribe if you want to see the other videos in this series. See you next week.